High in the Himalayas of Kashmir and Ladakh, 205 kilometers east of Srinagar, 234 kilometers to the west of Leh, is a small town whose name is made up of two words, Kar and Kil. Kar means castle, Kil means center. So, a place between castles, as the land historically lay between kingdoms. In 1999, this place became the center of much international intrigue and war between India and Pakistan. My name is Kabir Bedi, and today on Guns and Glory, we will talk about the time when India, at Kargil, had to fire over 250,000 shells, bombs and rockets across the LOC to bring Pakistan to its senses. On 20th of February 1999, at the Wagha border, the Prime Minister of Pakistan waited to receive his guests. This was the inaugural trip of the Delhi Lahore bus service and the first visit to Pakistan by an Indian Prime Minister in 10 years. When Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee alighted from the bus, it seemed that the ice of suspicion and misunderstanding between the two neighbors was finally on the verge of a thaw. As Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif stepped forward, first there was a handshake, and then the Prime Minister of India initiated a hug, which seemed to be grudgingly reciprocated by the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Across Pakistan, there had been agitations against the visit. In Karachi, a cardboard replica of the bus had been burnt. In Lahore, a policeman had died. And one of the most, if not the most powerful man in Pakistan was conspicuous by his absence. Pakistan's chief of army staff, General Parvez Musharraf, had boycotted the event at Vaga. Prime Minister Vajpayee told the people of Pakistan that his message to them was short and simple. Put aside the bitterness of the past and let us together make a new beginning. In November 1998, about three months before Atal Bihari Vajpayee set off on the bus to meet Nawaz Sharif, Lieutenant General Mahmood Ahmed, an artillery officer commanding the 10 Corps in Pakistan, went to meet his chief, General Parvez Musharraf. Lieutenant General Ahmed was accompanied by Major General Javed Hassan, who commanded the Frontier Constabulary of the Northern Areas. Present at this meeting was a fourth general, Lieutenant General Muhammad Aziz, a Kashmiri by birth, who at that time was Chief of General Staff in the Pakistan Army. These four generals, in November 1998, decided to dig up and execute a plan that had been made but shelved many years ago. In the Kargil district of Jammu and Kashmir, the winter is long and harsh, and the summer short and dry. In summer, temperatures can go up to 30 degrees Celsius. In winter, they can plummet to minus 35. Along the entire western border of the district runs the disputed LOC, the line of control that divides Kashmir between India and Pakistan. The contours of the line of control are maintained by the armies of both the countries, who man bunkers and posts along the demarcation. But in this desolate landscape, there existed an unwritten understanding. In the cold harshness of winter, the armies would climb down from the highest of their posts and leave them unattended till the summer. This understanding ended in 1999, when four Pakistani generals put into motion a simple but devious plan to destabilize the status quo. From Rawalpindi Army Headquarters, a secret order went out. Occupy the bunkers and posts in the Dras Kargil sector 
that the Indian Army had vacated in the winter of 1998-99. Unknown to Vajpayee, and possibly even to Nawaz Sharif, as India and Pakistan were announcing to the world the beginning of a new era in Indo-Pakistan relationship, Pakistan's Northern Light Infantry had already occupied 132 Indian posts and controlled an area of about 130 square kilometers that stretched over a 100-kilometer front with depths ranging between 7 to 15 kilometers inside Indian territory. And yet, during this period, on March 21st, 1999, Prime Ministers Vajpayee and Sharif signed the Lahore Declaration. In the last days of April 1999, Tashi Namgyal, Morup Sering, and Ali Raza Stanba from the tiny village of Garkhun took their flock of sheep up to the Banju Heights near Kargil. Morup carried with him his prized possession, a pair of powerful binoculars. On the morning of May 3rd, Tashi Namgyal borrowed the binoculars to look for game to hunt. But what he saw were men in Pathan suits digging bunkers. Over the next few days, the army sent out a few patrols, and while they did encounter some hostile elements and some skirmishes took place, the extent of the excursion was not known until Captain Saurabh Kalia's entire patrol went missing. IC58522F, Lieutenant Kalia was commissioned into the Indian Army in December 1998. The 22-year-old officer joined the 4th Jat Regiment and was posted to Kargil in January 1999. On May 15th, Lieutenant Kalia and five soldiers were on a patrol in the Bajrang post in the Kaksar sector of Jammu and Kashmir. For 22 days, there was no news of Lieutenant Saurab Kalia and his patrol. Well after war had already broken out in Kargil, their mutilated bodies were handed over to India. Autopsy reports showed extreme torture, including cigarette burns, eardrums pierced with hot rods, and amputated limbs. Fourteen years later, a former soldier of Pakistan's Northern Light Infantry appeared on a video clip, claiming to have been one of the Pakistani soldiers responsible for the death of Lieutenant Kalia. Lieutenant Kalia and his patrol were captured and killed because they had seen the intruders. The Northern Light Infantry were taking no chances. While successive foot patrols and chopper reconnaissance by the Indian Army did find proof of incursions, it was not till the middle of May 1999 that the larger picture became clear. Initially, we thought it was just the infiltrators, the Mujahideen. But then, as you know, we started launching a series of probing attacks, we found that it was not the Mujahideen, it was the regular Pakistan Army. This was no ordinary infiltration, but a full-scale occupation. And the Indian Army needed to retake those positions with force. About one year before all this happened, the BJP-led NDA coalition had come to power in Delhi. In its election manifesto, the BJP, among other pledges, had promised the induction of nuclear weapons. On May the 11th, and May 13th, 1998, India had stunned the world by conducting five nuclear tests. Fifteen days later, on May 28th, Pakistan announced its entry into the nuclear club with tests of its own. A shocked international community immediately imposed sanctions on both countries. So in May 1999, when India began to fire the massive Bofors guns to drive Pakistan out of Kargil, there was great fear that this conflict between neighbors 
would end in a nuclear war. The ferocity of the Indian artillery response was unprecedented. No single piece of artillery proved more valuable in the assault than the Beaufort's FH-77B 155mm howitzer. Its long-range heavy caliber shells easily destroyed flimsy enemy bunkers. The Beaufort's guns, which had a range of 24 kilometers at sea level, were found capable of firing beyond the 40 kilometer mark in the rarefied atmosphere of Kargil. The Indian Army deployed 130 Beaufort's guns. Most of them came under the command of a man who came to be known as the enraged bull of Dras. Beaufort has each shell weighing 43 kilos. So every shell which you fired on them did make a dent in the enemy defenses and did cause a lot of casualties. I think one of the major reasons the enemy drew back from these places was because of the Beaufort fire. As commander of the 8th Mountain Division's artillery brigade at Dras, Brigadier Singh lined up all the guns in his batteries and concentrated on one objective at a time. In one crucial assault, 100 guns concentrated their fire at one point, point .5140 in Tololing. We made sure that every time we attack, attack an objective, we had adequate guns to pound that objective, so we don't suffer casualties. India's 56th Mountain Brigade was deployed to the Dras sector in the second half of May. Pakistani positions along the Tololing complex formed the deepest incursions into Indian territory. As the NLI had begun to target indirect fire onto the Srinagar Leh Highway, Tololing uh, was about was the furthest deepest penetration which uh, Pakistan army had conduct, had carried out, and it was threatening the to cut off the national highway uh, leading to Leh. And uh, all uh, enemy had to do from there was to roll down. The Loling had to be cleared fast, so the 56th Mountain Brigade committed two infantry divisions to the task. The 18 Grenadiers went for the Tololing top, and the one Naga went for point five one four zero. There was no time even for reconnaissance or carrying out proper acclimatization. We were just given order to capture Tololing at the earliest and there was hardly any artillery support available at that time. The attacks began on 22nd May. That's when the 18 Grenadiers and the one Naga discovered that the Pakistani positions were extremely well defended. Movement was slow. The Indians had to crawl up rocky cliffs under intense fire. After a week of inching forward, the twin assaults were halted by very heavy Pakistani fire. After eight days of battle, the Grenadiers suffered more than 150 casualties, and the one Naga fared no better. Tololing was the most fierce, deadliest, and bloodiest battle which we encountered. We suffered very heavy casualties since enemy was on dominating heights. The units initially deployed to Kargil arrived ill-equipped to face the hardships of mountain warfare. The troops were not even fully acclimatized, and they had not counted on such well-entrenched and well-equipped enemy forces. But the Indian Army quickly retooled its approach to face the rigorous challenges of a high-altitude war. The two Rajputana rifles were deployed to Sonamar and carried out acclimatization and strategic training before moving to take up positions at Dras. The battalion requisitioned appropriate gear to suit the climate. On the 3rd of June, the two Raj Rif, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel M.B. Rabindranath, 
reported to the 56th Mountain Brigade and were given immediate orders to cease to loading. We tried to maintain surprise or we actually accepted in maintaining surprise by dumping ammunition only at night for six days. And uh, then uh, after six days, the final day we actually went and lied logo next to the objective areas for whole day without moving and then attacked the next day. On the night of June 12th, 20 artillery batteries consisting of 120 guns began a continuous six-hour barrage aimed at Pakistani positions on the clifftops. The 18 grenadiers, who were stuck midway up the ridge, set up their own barrage. Under the cover of this tremendous cannonade, the two Rajrif moved towards Tiloling Peak along both the chosen axes. The big guns kept firing till the Indian attackers were a mere 200 meters from their objective. When they suddenly fell silent, the Rajrif soldiers, supported by fires from the 18 Grenadiers, decimated the Northern Light Infantry and took possession of Tololing Top. My unit and the two Rajrif finally captured Tololing on 13 June 1999 and I lost 25 brave officers, JCOs and men. About three, the enemy again tried to retake the Lulim top uh, by attacking, uh, launching a counter-attack. I think the numbers were in our favor, so we were able to beat back the attack. On June the 13th, amid heavy shelling, Prime Minister Vajpayee paid a visit to Kargil to boost the morale of the Indian troops. India was determined to hit back hard. But let's leave the war on the ground for a moment and take to the skies, because the use of the Indian Air Force in the conflict set Kargil apart, it being considered a war and not just a border skirmish. The Indian Air Force began offensive operations at 06.30 hours on May 26th. Six successive attacks were launched using MiG-21s and MiG-27s. The targets were intruder bunkers, supply lines and supply dumps in the Dras and Batalik sectors. They used rocket attacks and strafing passes over enemy dugouts in the face of intense enemy fire. And Mi-17 helicopters attacked positions on Tiger Hill. Because we were not allowed to cross the LC, we had to be dependent on what the army tells us is the position of some targets. And these targets were not easily seen, not even from the ground, leave alone from the air. But our strategy was to hit those targets as best as we could. India took a major decision in launching the IAF into action in Kargil. The fear was it would escalate the scale of war and hostilities might not be limited to the Kargil sector. It was a calculated risk that India had to take, but a necessary one. Had Pakistan decided to use their air force and anger on our side, we would have lost a tremendous amount of, uh, we would have had a tremendous amount of casualties because our people were out in the open without any defenses at all. But on the second day of the air attacks, disaster struck. A high enough formation of MiG-27s took off, tasked with destroying enemy positions in the Batalik subsector. Each MiG-27 carried 40 deadly 80mm rockets and was armed with 30mm cannons. Flight Lieutenant K. Nachiketa was flying number two to squadron leader A. Mandokot. Zeroing in on the target, Flight Lieutenant Nachiketa fired all his 40 rockets in one salvo. He came back for a second attack with his 30 mm guns. Nachikata, unfortunately, he fired his weapon and there is a uh, disadvantage on that type of aircraft, the MiG-27, that when this sort of armament, this sort of rocket is fired, there is a chance, I repeat, there is a chance 
that some engine malfunction could occur. There were so many others and this was his second attack in that particular area. Only in this second attack there was a problem and his engine malfunctioned and he was too low at that time and he punched out. He punched out and he was taken prisoner of war. When Flight Lieutenant Nachiketa ejected, Squadron Leader Ajay Ahuja, also airborne on a mission at the same time, stayed over the area in an attempt to spot his landing site to direct rescue helicopters to pick him up. So he, he trying to look for it, he started to turn around and his aircraft was heavily loaded. And in the result, and it was underpowered as well. Uh, that type of aircraft is generally underpowered. So he lost height. He lost height. He came within the range of uh, uh, the surface-to-air missiles and got shot. Squadron leader Huja was flying on the Indian side of the Yellow Sea when he was hit. He was posthumously awarded the Veer Chakra. Then again, on May 28th, a Mi-17 helicopter on an attack mission at Tololing was destroyed by a Pakistani shoulder-fired missile. The entire crew of four, Squadron Leader R. Pundhir, Flight Lieutenant S. Muhilan, Sergeant R. K. Sahu, and Sergeant P. V. N. R. Prasad were killed. The missile didn't come from the target that he was attacking. The missile came from the side, which only gave the indication that the number of missiles they had was quite a lot. So from then onwards, after the third day, we took the helicopters off combat duties and we raised the height of operation to above the danger height of the missiles. And we said, all right, we will operate at th those heights and we will drop bombs from those heights. The IAF suspended attack helicopter operations, but the air attack continued effectively. In Kargil, it was a real challenge for fighter pilots not to stray over the LOC as ordered. But air warfare at such heights had other major challenges too. In those mountains, supersonic jets could see their targets only at the last minute. Also, aircraft and ammunition did not behave as per norms, so the IAF had to adapt. In 50 days, what the IAF learned and put into practice in Kargil is now taught to fighter pilots across the world. For now, let's leave the IAF pounding Pakistani positions as I, Kabir Bedi, say goodbye. And in the next episodes of Guns and Glory, we'll join the ground troops as they scale the treacherous slopes to regain the heights of Kargil. <laughs>